Uh, so last year, I uh, went on exchange to Europe. I went to Amsterdam for a period of six months. It was an amazing process. I went to travel to uh, some 14 cities over the course of a few weeks. I took a lot of what appear apparently seemed to be stock photos of bridges and canals in Amsterdam, and I grew a travel beard, most importantly. These are very important uh, things to do when you're, when you're on exchange. But um, I also spent a lot of time talking with my friends back at home. And because of the time difference, um, a lot of these conversations would take place in the wee hours of the morning, and I found myself staying up quite late for 5 a.m. And when you're in a new city, uh, and everything is kind of strange and unfamiliar, and you're regularly staying up to 4 or 5 a.m., you can kind of fall into these very unusual uh, existential crises where even the most uh, innocuous minutia end up driving you crazy. This happened to me one night when I was uh, having a conversation on Facebook with a friend and realized that every time I press a button on my computer, someone halfway across the world is instantaneously receiving my messages. This was the craziest thing I had ever experienced in my life, even though we all do it every single day, you know, all day. This was ridiculous to me. I, I couldn't understand how this was even happening. So I decided I would read about how we ended up here, how we are now able to communicate uh, so quickly. And what I started to think about was how communication across an ocean, for example, the fastest we could do was to be something like this, you know, send a, send a message on a ship from Amsterdam or something like this, whereas now we communicate more like this. Uh, you know, <laughs> th this is more typical of, of our instant communication. So how did we get there? Um, and in my reading, I came to discover that one individual in particular was responsible for many of the advances that have led us to the modern day uh, computer and cell phone technologies that we rely on. And this guy uh, was named Charles Babbage and 200 uh, years ago uh, designed the blueprints for what we would now call the computer. So this was a ridiculous, uh, well, it wasn't a discovery, but something I read. Uh, and I started to read more and more about Babbage, and so today I'm going to talk to you not only about uh, his life and his work, but also about some of the things I've learned, some life lessons that I've acquired through Charles Babbage. So today we'll, we, we will be finding Babbage is the, is the theme of the day. Well, Charles Babbage was alive uh, and working productively at the beginning of the 1800s, the early 19th century, and what he did was take two ideas which at the time were seen as very separate and not related. And he did uh, what the writer Matt Ridley would call uh, allowing two ideas to have sex. And the child, what was born of these two ideas, is what we now call the computer. So I'm gonna tell you what those two, two ideas were. The first comes from um, a French man by the name of Joseph Marie Jacquard, who was in the clothing manufacturing business. He designed a loom, which is a device for uh, weaving uh, fabrics and cloth and clothes and curtains and things of the like. At the time, in the early 19th century and before, at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, the best way to design complicated patterns on fabrics was to hire a bunch of people, usually children, to sit around a large, dangerous, steam-powered machines and pull little strings and levers, and it was a, a major operation. Jacquard had the brilliant idea of automating this process. So instead of uh, having a picture on a wall that you would attempt to mimic by stitching or whatever, he designed the fabric's patterns onto punched cards. And this was essentially the birth of the idea of programmability. What would happen is the punched cards you can see at the top of the image would be fed through the machine and automatically weave patterns into the fabric. In some sense, this is the first computer, and it's not even a computer, it's a loom. So there's the first idea Charles Babbage was very fond of. The second comes from another uh, Frenchman by the name of Gaspard de Prony. Napoleon 
when he was trying to uh, take over the world and things of that nature, needed his army and navy to have very good navigational tables. It was important that if you're going to you know, conquer some foreign country, you have good measurements of longitude and latitude, and that required a lot of complicated math to do those calculations. So uh, De Pony was a mathematician and scientist, and Napoleon asked him to make more accurate tables. Now at the time, the way that this was done was, um, you would get a large group of mathematicians into a room and they would just kind of grind out the equations and it would take a while and they're prone to error. But what uh, he realized was that you could change the process of computation into something like an assembly line manufacturing business. So instead of having all of the fancy mathematicians doing all the work, he would break down the problem into tiny pieces and hire a group of people who only knew how to do addition and they would add the numbers, and they would send it along the conveyor belt, so to speak, down to the next group who would do the multiplication, down to the next group who would do the exponentiation, et cetera, until it got to the fancy mathematicians who would do the final finishing steps on the algorithms. And in this process, the uh, procedure of doing calculations, which, by the way, were done by a group of people known as computers, that is, people who compute. So this right here is, in another sense, the first computer. Um, greatly expedited the process of mathematical computation. So what Charles Babbage took these two ideas and put them together into an incredible machine that he designed but did not build. This was uh, built many years later called the Difference Engine. These long columns that you can see are made up of gears and cranks and pulleys and levers, and the gentleman on the side is twisting a crank that's essentially making this machine um, take programmed instructions from a punched card, just like the Jacquard loom, and column by column do addition, multiplication, exponentiation, et cetera, to get an answer to, say, finding the next number in a pattern or giving you a result of an algorithm, and this is what a computer is. Of course, this machine didn't have a screen that you could see a browser on, but it did have a little uh, printer that you could see the results on in ink. So this is truly a computer, and it's truly bonkers that this came out in 1820. So after uh, reading about all of this, I was traveling around Europe. I was in London, where uh, Babbage was from, and I figured, I have a moral obligation to go see this stuff. I mean, it's, it's here. It's it exists, I can go visit it. So I did, I went to the um, Science Museum in London, and as soon as I walked in, he, these are all my pictures, some terrible selfies ahead, uh, of, of the, an original Jacquard loom. So this right here, you can look at your cell phone, this is what preceded it in the same lineage of uh, technology. The next thing I found on the left there is me with the uh, Babbage computational engine, that's the machine you saw the video of a moment ago. And then on the right, if you can see in the bottom right, there's me with, with Babbage, a picture of him, and a nice chunk of his brain. So I spent a long time staring at that uh, in absolute wonderment that this, this, this man's brain was right in front of me. Kind of cool. So I was in London, and I figured, well, he's, Babbage is from London. There are a lot of intellectual people there. M maybe I should uh, contact someone in the city, maybe a professor at a university or something, to see if they can tell me uh, something interesting uh, that I might not have known about Babbage. First, though, en route there, I took a stop to Babbage's home. Um, and so this is where he lived. There's a nice, uh, it's been renovated, but this is where he lived for many years. Uh, he's right across the street, actually, from the fictional house of Sherlock Holmes. Um, and so I was feeling kind of brave. So I knocked on the door, and a woman answered the door, and I said, this is the strangest thing you're gonna hear all day. This guy lived here, Charles Babbage. Do you know anything about him? And she told me an amazing story. Babbage apparently was host to the most turned parties in all of Victorian England. I mean, she didn't use this language, but it was lit. <laughs> Luminaries like Charles Dickens, the novelist, 
Charles Darwin, the Duke of Wellington, the man who ended up defeating Napoleon in battle, they would turn up at Babbage's house and it was like the, you know, one of the best types of parties ever. The other thing, when I started reading more about Babbage's personal life, I discovered that he was what I would call a 19th century Kanye West. He was a genius, knew it, and needed you to know it too. Um, so he would do things like when the government would reject his uh, applications for funding, he would storm into the office, look the uh, parliamentarians in the eye and say, mark this day down, it's the worst day of your life. Very Kanye-esque. He didn't do any jump, you know, uh, whiling out, but still, you can imagine he would have. Um, and so, inspired by this man's audacity to, to, to uh, talk to people about himself, I thought, why don't I go talk to some people about Babbage too? So I messaged a mathematician by the name of Hannah Fry, just on a whim saying, do you know anything about this guy? And much to my luck, she responded saying, yes, I'm actually giving a lecture that will be filmed for a BBC documentary. Tomorrow, you should come. I said, okay, this is kind of sweet, so there we are. I didn't get, manage to get any footage of the lecture because it was being filmed for a documentary, but I did get a sweet selfie. And Hannah Fry is what I would call uh, a C-list mathematical celebrity. She does have a video on YouTube with a million views. So this was a pretty big deal. Um, and, and, and that's kind of when I realized, is this how this works? If I just email people, do they respond saying, sure, I'll put you on TV? Is this, is this how I get my big break? So, Inspired by Charles Babbage's willingness to just go all out um, without shame, I, I adopted a new uh, life motto, which was email your heroes. And so I, 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 after this visit, I went home and I sent all the emails I could to all the people that have inspired me in hopes that I would get a similar response to this. So I did, I sent some messages to my favorite musicians. I have not received uh, any response from the publishing people of Kanye West or Chance the Rapper. I messaged my favorite athletes. LeBron James has rudely yet to respond. Um, and I also sent some more fun emails, such as this. Um, my message to the Nobel Committee nominating Justin Bieber's public relations team for all five canonical Nobel Prizes. I, I, I had a long list of reasons why uh, they deserve it. They orchestrated one of the greatest comebacks in musical history, and I had references, citations, etc. cetera. Uh, nothing. <laughs> However, I did send emails to my academic heroes and fortunately, they did respond the very next day, incredibly kindly. Uh, I sent messages to uh, Douglas Hofstadter and Steven Pinker, who um, I've learned a lot from through uh, reading their writings and seeing what they've done academically. And in some sense, they are part of the Charles Babbage lineage of academia. They both do work on uh, minds and machines, which is exactly the spirit of what Babbage wanted to do, excuse me, when he built the, uh, the first computer. Perhaps more practically, as a motivation for you, potentially, to email your heroes following this, I messaged some other people who gave me a job. So that's far less, um, you know, celebrity named, but uh, good at getting you some cash. <laughs> so there's the first uh, life lesson from Charles Babbage. The second came to me when I was reading his uh, personal diaries and autobiography. And I came across uh, a quote that struck me as very, very interesting. It says this, the offending instrument should invariably be detained by the police and taken to the station to be destroyed or only to be returned on payment of a small fine by the offending party within three days after the seizure. Now on reading this, and you might be thinking, what is this about some, some sort of weapons, he supporting some gun legislation? No, 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 this is about uh, hula hoops. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, Charles Babbage, as he aged, as many people do, became more and more cranky. Uh, and the woman that was living in his house pointed to the balcony and said, uh, Charles Babbage would sit here and throw um, fruit and vegetables at the kids when they were playing outside and making a ruckus and bothering him. So th th this kind of got me thinking a little bit, can this guy who is so incredibly 
forward thinking to the point where he invented the technology that now dominates society be so uh, regressive as to suggest that hula hoops are destroying society. But then I, in doing more reading, I came to realize that this view was uh, exceptionally prominent. Like in this quotation, conversation is said to be a lost art. Good talk presupposes leisure, both for preparation and enjoyment. The age of leisure is dead, and the art of conversation is dying. Now, of course, this is a quote from the year 1890, but how familiar does this sound to us? It might have been something that was said to you um, by you know, someone who was worried that you were spending too much time uh, texting or on Facebook or on Instagram, et cetera. And this picture and this quote could easily go back to back, even though they're separated by 120 years. So this is a, a, an all too uh, common sentiment, the feeling that every new technology from you know, what we used to use, the Tamagotchi, to Vine, to the selfie stick, uh, is destroying society, it's, it's ruining our ability to communicate, our language is deteriorating because we have to think in 140 characters. And yet in reading more and more like this, you come to realize that these worries are, have been with us well before Charles Babbage and continuous throughout the, uh, throughout the history of really people talking. Um, and so uh, this struck me as very interesting, a picture that I saw on Facebook completely by chance uh, last week, this image of a nice, uh, cute uh, kid born in 1993, gets for gifts, oh, football, uh, Game Boy, all this nice wholesome stuff, and uh, he says, oh, thank you, love you, mom and dad, and then this nasty child born in 2003 who gets all this luxurious stuff and has no appreciation for it. You can imagine that Images like this have existed for every single generation when we were born. Now, of course, we are the, this generation of perfect people on the left. Uh, there were pictures like this of 1983 versus 1993 and all the way back. And so here in some way lies what you could call a, a paradox of change, which is that the more that our uh, technologies and our ways of interacting uh, become more effective and efficient, the more that these old worries of the past keep on getting reiterated louder and louder and louder. And so next time you maybe hear something like that or feel that way yourself, maybe about a younger sibling, for example, remind yourself that the guy that invented the device that's allowing you to play Angry Birds all day felt the same way too. So perhaps maybe you should alleviate some of that worry. And so there you have it. There is my uh, journey with, with the man, uh, Charles Babbage. Uh, in, in some sense, he teaches us that there is a good purpose to studying the past. We have a lot to learn from people that lived 250 years ago. Uh, not only that our technology has an exciting and fascinating history, but also some, some important life lessons like emailing your heroes and realizing that the kids are all right. So we have much to learn from Charles Babbage. You should think of him whenever you do a Snapchat. <laughs> Thank you very much.